My name is Susanna Brower. I'm the assistant coordinator for the tutorial assistance program at the ARC. And um, that means that I'm in charge of the tutors who are not the writing tutors. So any tutoring that you've come to over at the ARC that deals with anything but writing is the tutors that I work with. And I'll let um, Amber and Jennifer introduce themselves and then we'll go into the next slide. So Amber is also gonna be advancing the slides for us. So there's gonna be you know, a little bit of letting her know that we're ready to go to the next slide. So you'll kind of hear that in the middle of things. So go ahead. Um, so I am Jennifer Kabetsky. I am the coordinator of the writing support program at the ARC, which means I oversee everything writing related at the ARC. Um, so in addition to overseeing the writing tutors, myself and my colleague Jay Spencer also work with students one-on-one -on, -one, um, on their essays for uh, health profession schools. Um, one thing I do want to clarify, if you do want to meet with us, um, we, unfortunately, my program can only work with current UCR undergrads, so not alumni. Um, Amber's and Charlie's program is different, um, and we are kind of a complement to them. So you also, you work with them and us to put together the best application. And I'm Amber Nicholson. I'm the Assistant Director of the Health Professions Advising Center. So I will be representing the piece of letter writers specifically related to careers in the health field medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, uh, physician assistant, veterinary medicine. Uh, there's a lot of commonality among all of those programs. So a majority of the students attending today are likely interested in a career in medicine. But even if you're interested in an alternative health career, the information that we're going to be sharing today is gonna to be translatable across almost all health professions programs. Can I add something very quickly? If you are in this workshop and you are interested in a letter of rec not for a health profession, could you just say something in the chat? Because uh, this is tailored for health professions, but we can include information for other kinds of situations if people are interested. Right, and that's something that I was going to add also, that we do address kind of other, part, other types of applications also. So this, you will find information relevant, whatever it is that you're applying for. Um, so, the reason that we put together this workshop a couple of years ago, I think now, right? I think we've been doing it almost at least a year and a half, um, is that we, we, all of us have written letters of recommendation for people and kind of advise people on how to approach this. And we've seen it approached very, very well. And in certain circumstances, it, because it is a very new process for a lot of people, there are bits and pieces of information that are missing when we get those requests. And so we decided it was a good thing to help students get a better sense of how to approach recommendations, how to provide information to your recommender so that your recommendation request really is kind of comprehensive and ready to go. <clears throat> and you open, um, you know, open that door easily for your, your recommenders. So we're really trying to demystify this entire process. The application process for anything is a potentially a scary thing. Um, and letters of recommendation feel like the part that are least within your control. And in some ways that's true, but we really want to help you feel no longer like this is pushing this big boulder uphill that's going to come down and, and smash you and you don't have any control over that and really have you feeling a lot better as you um, get through this process and start requesting letters from recommenders. So we're going to take you through three different steps. We've got a step where we're gonna to talk to you about how you should be informed about what this process looks like. Um, Self-evaluating, so taking a look at yourself and seeing how ready you really are to apply for whatever it is that you're looking ahead at. And then organizing and planning that request um, and making the re request itself. So I'm ready to go, okay. So one of the things is animations are missing, so you're not kind of seeing the surprise, you know, we're not bringing this in little by little to you, but something that we want you to think about is that your application as a whole is really like a puzzle, okay? And letters of recommendation are only one piece of that puzzle. So the other three quarters of this puzzle, as you can see here in this pie, um, are really things that you've been working on and you have a great deal of control over, right? So your qualifications for whatever it is that you're applying for whether that's grad school, whether it's a health profession, whether it's an internship or a job, are things that you've been working on since you arrived on this campus, okay? So you've been taking the courses that you need to take in order to be a good candidate. 
you've been working on getting those grades that you need, right? If there are exams that you have to take to prepare yourself for that, you've been getting ready to take those as well. Your extracurriculars that might be relevant and needed in order to be a good applicant, you've been doing that, right? So those pieces of the puzzle you have been taking care of and you're going to continue to take care of. The personal statements or any other writing that you have to do, as Jennifer and Amber both talked about, there are resources here on campus that are ready to help you, and you're the one who's going to put those things together, right? So again, the control for you is there in those things, and you have professionals who've worked with a lot of people to get them through those statements and get really polished and good versions of what you want to say um, ready to send in with your application. So that's another thing that you've got control over, your log logistics. When are those deadlines? What is it that's required in order to apply for that particular program? Again, those are things that you can research, find out online, and really kind of line up for yourself so that you're good to go. As I mentioned, the letters of recommendation are the part where you feel like you have the least control. You're putting that in someone else's hands, right? You're asking them to say something about you, and you're not going to see the final product. You can't know precisely what they say. But we're going to help you understand that there actually is a fair amount of control that you have in that aspect of your application and this puzzle also, right? And we're going to give you those bits and pieces so that you feel a little bit more solid and more in control of that part of it as well. All right, next. All right, so something applicants often, oh, there's a lot of feedback. Okay, something applicants often don't realize is that different kinds of applications have different recommender requirements. Um, and these are not always stated, so we do wanna kind of go through them. So first thing really is what are you applying for? Because that's gonna have a huge effect on who you ask, right? So if you're applying to grad schools, such as master's or PhD programs, um, you're going to want to ask one group of people and we'll kind of get into exactly what kinds of people um, you're going to want to talk to versus professional schools like med school, law school, internship jobs, all of these. So really just kind of what are you applying to? I know most of you are doing health professions in this particular presentation, but think about what you're applying to. Also, what kind of recommendation do you need? Um, so some want an actual letter, some just want a reference check, some want a questionnaire with short answers where they rate you. Um, you really, really want to know this ahead of time before you ask your recommender and communicate it to your recommender. So if I am asked to write a letter, if I'm asked to write a letter of recommendation, and I write this letter and then I go in and discover they just want a reference check, how long did this person work here? Were they a, a good worker? Uh, I'm annoyed at the extra effort. Now, if I'm expecting a reference check and the day of I discover I need to write a letter, then that letter's not gonna be as good as it could be because I didn't have enough time. So do some research, check this out beforehand. Um, and this is where Google really, really is your friend. Um, so if you're applying to an academic opportunity, such as a master's or PhD, you're gonna to wanna to talk to faculty in your field to find out kind of what um, kinds of recommendations you're gonna need. Um, many scholarships have guidelines on their website for who you should ask. For professional schools like um, med schools, they actually have recommend, like guidelines on the website that you can share with your, um, with your letter writers and might help guide you to who you want. Um, so really do some research beforehand to figure out kind of what kind of recommenders they want and uh, what, what is involved in the recommendation. So uh, next slide, which I think is Amber's. Okay, so the next step to this process is for us to ask you all to take a step back and do a little bit of self-evaluation. If you're a pre-med student, you know that this is the time where AMCAS is getting ready to open, potentially a lot of students uh, in a normal climate would be preparing to take an MCAT exam. And students oftentimes feel that as a junior or as a senior, they need to apply because this is quote unquote the time to apply. 
There is a lot of analogy between applying to graduate and professional schools and applying to college. When you guys applied to come to UCR, you applied between November 1st and November 30th um, through the UC Common App, um, right? You kind of had that one window of opportunity to apply. And if you missed that opportunity or more likely one of your peers missed that opportunity, Perhaps they weren't able to matriculate directly to college. They had to attend a community college or were a transfer student. And so students kind of really uh, continue that analogy, thinking that they only have one opportunity to really apply to a graduate or professional school. When in all reality, there are a lot of overlaps between applying to undergrad and applying to professional schools. The, the processes happen in a very similar way with the exception of the fact that applying to graduate or professional school is much more seated in doing so when you're quote unquote ready. Um, these applications open and close every year and students, the expectation is really that they apply in an application cycle in which they have a strong and competitive application. We're not necessarily gonna get into the extreme details of what that um, quote unquote strong application would look like, but some of that is gonna be seated in your academic metrics. So thinking about is your GPA, particularly your science GPA in line with the program in which you wanna to apply to, the average science GPA for medical school is a 3.6, the average science GPA for PA programs is a 3.5, um, so really kind of making sure academically you're a good fit for programs. Um, it is very expensive to apply, so making sure that hopefully you're not wasting money that you don't necessarily have to spend to apply over and over and over and over again. Um, potentially there might be some exam requirements, extracurricular requirements, um, timeline things. So just making sure that you're well versed on the process of applying and the academic and extracurricular qualifications of applying. Meeting with your academic advisor, your HPAC advisor, maybe a PI or a faculty member if you're pursuing a graduate program, a PhD program. A meeting with Jen and Jay if you're struggling with your writing to make sure that you are meeting the timelines of, of having a polished personal statement. That's just something that we're asking you to self-evaluate on. In terms of logistics, um, ensuring you have enough time to complete this process, do you have enough time to write your personal statement and your extracurricular essays? Do you have enough time to share that information with your letter writer so that they're able to craft a strong letter of recommendation? Because you all are attending this session in mid-April, um, you, you will definitely have enough time to facilitate an application process that happens in early, late summer, or maybe even into fall. So you all are, are ahead of the game or in the right time frame especially if you're attending this as a sophomore, junior, maybe you're not even thinking of applying for another year, but you just wanna have this information in your back pocket to use when needed. Sometimes we do this presentation throughout the summer or fall where students um, maybe might be three to six months already past the start of the application. And, and we need to tell them that although they can apply, maybe it's not going to do their application the best service to apply so late in the cycle or maybe they think that they can ask for a letter of recommendation five days before the due date. Um, and that's not going to be quite so feasible as Susanna will talk about in a second in terms of timing of all of this stuff. So it's just kind of being aware and self-evaluating is a way that you can manage the stress of this process. Okay, so how do you choose your recommenders? So we really want you to remember this kind of analogy of the puzzle because your application is a puzzle and what pieces you choose really is gonna depend on the picture you're trying to make. So one thing I do wanna stress is you don't have to get a recommender who can speak about everything, right? One person is unlikely to be able to speak about your academic ability, your scientific ability, are you a good person, right? I mean, if you have someone who can do that, awesome. But realistically, you don't 
need that. And having different people speak to different strengths is a really good way to set up an application because each person can kind of focus on something different about you. So kind of think about what does the program need to know about me? What demonstrates that I'm qualified and what helps me stand out? And then who knows me well enough to write about what makes me qualified? So for example, if you're applying for an academic opportunity, so grad school, a summer research, um, generally things with research focuses are going to want faculty to write you a letter because they can evaluate your ability to conduct research, they can evaluate your academic ability, your ability to contribute to the field. So I supervise, Susanna and I both supervise tutors at the ARC. If one of my tutors asked me to write them a letter of recommendation, I would not be able to speak about their academic ability because I haven't taught them, right? I, I hope they do well in class, um, but I can't evaluate that. Um, so, but if you think about other things, so professional programs may want to mix, right? They may want a mix of people who can speak to your academic ability, but they also may want people who can speak to your soft skills. So, for example, Suzanne and I, because we supervise tutors, we can talk about our tutors' ability to work with diverse people, to think on their feet, um, those kind of soft skills, right? And if you're applying for something where that's relevant, then you might want someone who can speak to that. And it's okay that that person can't also speak to your academics, you have somebody else speaking to your academics. It's worth noting, by the way, that some fields, including um, especially medicine, but health in general, have very, very specific guidelines about who you can ask. So when they say faculty, sometimes they mean faculty that taught you in a class versus faculty that supervised you in a lab. Uh, so definitely do your research. And if you have questions about that, Amber can speak a little bit more about it, but just making sure kind of you've got that. Academic programs generally don't care about if the person is class versus lab, just as long as they can speak to your abilities. So internships and jobs, they're mainly gonna want work references, right? They may not care that you got an A plus in your senior design class. Um, scholarships are gonna vary widely depending on what you're applying for. So if you are applying for a scholarship, look at what the scholarship is. So I work with students who do a public service scholarship. So they often have a letter from a community member. Whereas if you're applying to a PhD in biochemical research, they may be confused if you include a community member letter. Um, one thing I do wanna note, so academic programs, PhDs, masters, really don't want references from grad students, even co-written ones. Academia is kind of a snobby place. Uh, now, professional schools are different. They're often much more accepting of letters from grad students, especially if the grad student is the one you work with more closely. Um, they're often much more accepting of co-written letters as well. So again, doing some research ahead of time, which you're doing by coming to this, and thinking about who can best showcase my qualifications for this opportunity. And I just want to second everything that Jennifer just said. I know sometimes students can be um, nervous when they're hearing information about medical schools from somebody who they don't perceive doing direct pre-med advising, but Jennifer's information is correct and accurate as it relates to professional schools. In addition to that, um, just like to echo, you do really need to be looking at what individual letters are required by your specific medical schools, dental schools, or pharmacy schools. Um, there isn't a universal package of letters that's going to be applicable to every single medical school. Um, that is part of the requirements for each school. Similar to how some schools want psych and social, maybe some don't. Some require calculus, some don't. Some require biochemistry, some don't. So although there's a lot of commonality among prerequisites and requirements, there is also individuality because these are different medical schools. There's 200 MD and DO schools. So you really do need to, to research that. And if you're not able to provide a letter of recommendation that the school is asking for, then you generally don't want to apply to that school. 
you really don't want to give money in, in terms of application fees to a program to then find out you would be rejected simply because you didn't meet the prerequisites. And letter of recommendations are considered a prerequisite. So for example, a lot of osteopathic medical schools require a letter of recommendation from an osteopathic physician specifically. If that's not something that you or a student could supply, then it wouldn't necessarily be a strong financial decision to give application fees to an institution in which you couldn't supply the requirements for. So letters are requirements just like coursework is, and um, I just wanted to echo the importance of doing that research and ensuring that you can meet the requirements for those individual programs. And again, to stress, uh, when you're meeting the requirements, you don't need to have three letters that all each individually meet the requirements. You need to have three letters that collectively meet the requirements. Um, okay, so uh, we know not everybody is applying to med school, but they have a really well laid out little guide that we find really helpful to kind of illustrate um, the kinds of things you want to think about. So and not all applications or all letters are gonna to need to speak to all of these elements. But for example, if you look at our very first box, it talks about service orientation, social skills, cultural competence. Those are the types of things that supervisors potentially could talk about. Or if you've done volunteering, the volunteer coordinator, those are the types of things they could talk about. Now, critical thinking, quantitative reasoning, scientific inquiry. Your average volunteer coordinator may not be able to speak to those, but your professor might, right? Now, someone like Susanna, who supervises tutors, may be able to speak to critical thinking skills because her tutors have to be able to critically think through things um, to prevent, present accurate information, but she probably can't evaluate their scientific inquiry in and put it into a bigger context with the larger field there. So you want a faculty member for that. Um, same with reliability and dependability. So that may be something that a supervisor could speak to, an academic advisor could speak to, but it's also potentially something a lab professor could speak to, right? Do you show up? Do you get your experiments done? Do they have to email you 40 million times? Um, so resiliency and adaptability. So kind of what you're thinking is who can who do i know who can speak to these different guidelines in different ways and one person again does not have to do it all you want to have people who can speak to one thing at really well and you want to have somebody else who can speak to another thing really well right um, it doesn't all have to be all together the only piece i can um, add to that because again that's all accurate information as it relates to medical schools uh, Susanna mentioned earlier how much uh, angst or anxiety this process can create for more A-type personalities who tend to want to have control over a situation and, and, you know, of course with letters you're essentially giving up some of that control. That, that's true. An additional piece that I find students lose a lot of sleep over is this idea of faculty members writing, quote unquote, a good letter or a strong letter. And it's just important to remember that a, a good or strong faculty letter is going to be very academic in nature. A lot of your first year classes in your medical school, dental school, pharmacy school will actually be taught by PhDs and not by MDs, DDSs, or PharmDs. Those professionals teach more of your clinical skills courses that come a little later in your curriculum. So with your first year med school classes being taught by PhDs, the faculty that you're interacting with now also have PhDs and are well suited to evaluate what your academic ability is going to be in managing doctorate level curriculum, right? They've been through doctorate level programs and so they're well suited to be able to evaluate another student's ability to be successful in a similar program. So if a faculty member can also talk about you in additional avenues, that's beautiful, but the expectation of a quote unquote strong faculty letter is more academic and scientific in nature, similar to how 
Jennifer, Dr. Kavetsky would be fantastic in being able to evaluate a student's ability and maybe pursuing a, a PhD in, I guess, English or a writing discipline if she was teaching a class because that's something that she's completed herself. Hopefully that adds a little context to what a strong faculty letter might look like. Okay, so as we were talking about at the beginning, um, kind of taking you through the steps of what this application process looks like, before you even make the request for the letter of recommendation, you need to start gathering some information, right? So we talked about getting your information, planning, organizing that, and this is really on you, right? So it's your job as the student who's requesting the letter of recommendation for some, from someone to gather information about the programs that you are going to be applying to and to provide that to the person that you're going to ask, the person or people that you're going to ask for this letter from. Um, I think all of us, Amber and Jennifer and I, have all had situations where we've had people request letters from us and they give us very minimal information about who that letter is going to be going to um, and then perhaps don't respond to emails where we ask for additional information and we end up having to do the research. So really what you need to do as you're applying for these, um, these programs is gathering information about them. You want to have, and you can create a spreadsheet to kind of track all of this information and organize it well, the name of the grad school that you're applying to and the field. So the name of the program, right? So don't just say I'm applying to biochemistry, right? But what is the name of the program at the particular school that you're going to? Um, if it's a professional school, you can just say the School of Medicine. If they have an additional name, if it's more than that, provide that information to your recommender. Um, you can find this information on the program's website. You can look at their about information. You also want to look more deeply and see, as Jennifer was alluding to earlier, what type of recommendation they're wanting. So if it is a professional school, you are going to be looking for a letter of recommendation. But as we were mentioning, if you're applying for an internship or maybe even grad school, it could be that you're going to have to, your recommenders are going to um, fill out an evaluation online, right? And it's just clicking boxes and saying how much they agree or dis don't agree with particular criteria or how well they can evaluate you on those things. But you need to find out that information. It should not be your recommender who, as they're working on this, they discover, as Jennifer was mentioning, on the day that they go to turn this in that they actually needed to do less or more work than what they were ready to do. You also want to gather information on how that letter needs to be submitted. So is it gonna be sent through email? And if it is, then you need to get, if it's available, the contact name, so the person that that email is gonna to go to and their email address, and you need to provide that to your recommenders. Is the program going to create a link the moment that you input information about who your recommenders are. So the professional schools do this, right? So AAMC is going to, through their MCAS portal, generate a link that goes directly to your recommender and they'll just click on it and submit your information. Are you as an individual deciding instead to house your letters in Interfolio so that you can kind of grab those letters and send them on to your recommenders. That's an option. I believe um, it's a paid option though, and it's not required. You can just use the portal link and just have those letters um, go directly to, into the portal. Or is your letter going to have to go through the mail? And in some programs, this is still the case, right? So as Jennifer can tell you, um, snail mail is required for some um, PhD and grad school programs. Um, and in that case, if if it's true that your recommender is going to have to send a physical letter in the mail, you actually need to supply them with the envelope and that needs to be pre-addressed to the place that it's going to and with a stamp on it, right? So we used to have a little acronym for this for pre-addressed pre stamped envelopes. Um, do you want to add anything about that, Jen? Or did I get it? I think I must have gotten it. So the final thing that you must supply is give a deadline for the letter, right? So sometimes that deadline is the same as the application deadline. Sometimes there's a little bit of extra leeway for your recommender. So you want to let them know, does it need to go in at the same time that your, the rest of your application materials go in or can it go in on a slightly different timeline? And make sure that you're paying attention to what time is listed on there also. 
if it turns out it's Eastern time and the impression is that it could be Pacific time, you know, 1159 Pacific daylight time and your recommender turns in their letter at that time and it was actually an Eastern time zone that they were running off of, your letter is now three hours late, right? So you want to make sure that you you find out about that and you share that information with your recommenders. And as um, Amber and Jennifer were talking about, and as we showed you on the previous slide, some of the programs will provide letter writing guidelines also. If that's the case, please share that with your recommender. Some of them have seen them often and may be very familiar with them, but it doesn't, it normally doesn't hurt to attach that to the email that you send requesting the letter. Just some additional context about when to submit for medical schools. Um, you don't have to have the actual written letter submitted at the time that you apply. You do need to include the letter writer's name and contact information in your application. So you have to have identified who the letter writer is, but your letters will likely be submitted about a month or within a month of when you submit your primary application. So for AMCAS, hypothetically, let's say a student, Susanna, is going to submit her AMCAS application July 1st. She would want to speak with Jennifer, her letter writer, and have a conversation with Jennifer about having that letter submitted sometime between July 1st and July 31st. So there, there is a little bit of a buffer time in which letters can be submitted. And this is really genuinely, authentically a conversation that you need to have with your letter writer. Um, once a letter writer has agreed to write you a letter of recommendation, a lot of what happens after that is something that's more of a conversation individually between you and the letter writer, which I think kind of segues us into that next slide. I wouldn't necessarily tell a letter writer um, a deadline that they must follow for at least medical schools. If this is for a program that does have a firm deadline, obviously the letter writer needs to be aware of that. But when it relates to graduate and professional schools, um, it, it's more of a conversation that you and the letter writer will make a decision together on a timeline that makes sense for your application. So I try to approach that as more of a conversation between you two, as opposed to you dictating to the letter writer what they must or must not do. Okay, so now we're to the point where we're talking about making the request itself. So we're going to give general guidelines in this slide, but one of the things that we want to mention is that every recommender is going to have their own preferences and their own requirements, right? So if you're in a class with the person that you're going to be approaching for a letter, you need to pay cl close attention to whether or not they are sharing guidelines and expectations with you, right? And that could be that during a particular class, they address this question. It could be that it's shared in their syllabus. It could be that they post it to iLearn, right? or you've had a conversation with them otherwise and you become aware of what their preferences and their requirements are for a letter. So always check with your recommender, pay attention to what they've told you and go with that. If you have some doubt, ask them, okay? If you're gonna be asking them for a recommendation, you put yourself in a vulnerable place anyway, asking them for the specifics of what they want is only gonna paint you in a better light, right? That's gonna put you in a position where they're looking at you and saying, okay, this person wants to be sure that they're really addressing my needs and kind of making sure that I'm not going to be burdened, you know, in any kind of extraordinary way in the process of requesting this letter, right? But generally speaking, we want to remind you, and you know this, professionals are busy, right? Whether this is your faculty member, whether it's a member of the community, whether it's your supervisor, we're busy. We've got a lot to do. You all are busy too, right? But be aware of the fact that you can't spring a letter request on somebody a week or two before it's due. That's really unreasonable. Um, unfortunately, it's not going to create a situation where they're, they may want to write you a letter, they may be really excited about this process, but you've now put them in a bind where other deadlines that they have may conflict with that and they're having to kind of take extraordinary measures to get your letter done. Um, and they may actually refuse it and may not be able to write the letter for you when <clears throat> under normal circumstances had they had more time, they might have been very happy to do that for you. So give them sufficient time. 
ask for something or ask about four to six weeks before the letter is needed, okay, before it needs to be submitted. That's going to give them time to write you a good quality letter. Also, don't ambush people. Okay, right now in our remote circumstances, ambushing looks a little different than it does when we're on campus. But we're, what we're talking about in an on-campus situation is don't rush down to the bottom of the lecture hall at the end of the lecture. And while the professor is surrounded by other students and they're talking about what happened in the lecture and answering questions, say, oh, professor so-and-so, will you write me a letter of recommendation? And then get a quick yes or no and run off, right? That's not the kind of thing you want to do. You also don't want to like jump into the middle of um, office hours and just peek around the door and ask really quickly if you if they can write you a letter of recommendation. You need to approach this a lot more thoughtfully um, and give the person that you're asking for the letter some time to process whether or not it's something that they can do for you, okay? In the current situation, that ambushing is a little different. I'm not real sure what that would look like, but just be thoughtful again, right? So find out from your recommender, do they re prefer that that request come in person, that you have a conversation in a meeting with them, or that that request come by email? Um, I kind of like to have both if possible, especially for something like med school, because I want to have a sense of whether or not the person that is applying, um, why they're wanting to do that, right? So why is it that medicine in and of itself is something that they want to go into? But you're going to, um, either way, make sure that you've organized your information well, right? So if you're talking to the person in person, um, make sure that you have a handout with all the information that we were talking about earlier whether this is a spreadsheet, whether it's something with bullet points that kind of gives them a sense of what it is that you are asking for, right? Who you are, what they're applying for, what the deadlines are, where they're going to be sending in that information. If it's by email, again, well organized, right? Some of the information in the request is going to go into the body of the email and some of it will go in an attachment so that they can review it later. You don't want to overwhelm them with excessive content in the body of the email itself, okay? And this is something as um, Amber shared with you at the beginning of the presentation and as you all should have received via email. You have a sample requesting email that I received a couple of years ago, three years ago now, um, which was a really solid example. It was one of the very early examples that I got, but it does a really good job of laying out who you are, why you're applying, what you're applying for, what the deadlines are, what you want your recommender to know, about you, okay? And so that's kind of what's addressed in this next section here. So in addition to the details about the program that you're applying for, when you make the letter request, you want to remind the person that you're requesting the letter of who you are, right? How is it that they know you, right? If it's your PI or somebody that you have pretty constant contact with, they're gonna know you. You still wanna supply this information so that they have an easy place to go and look at it um, and have it all in one spot. But if it's a faculty member that you had a class with two years ago, they may not remember you after having had three quarters of 500 student classes, right? So you wanna place yourself in some kind of context. You wanna let them know when did you interact with them, right? And so don't, don't just say, I was in a class with you two years ago. When, what quarter, okay? If you work with somebody, so Jennifer and I and Amber also, who has her um, HPAC ambassadors, um, student ambassadors. We don't deal with 500 students at a time, but we work with enough students and there's enough of a turnover that if you tell me you used to work for me, I'm going to probably remember you, but I may not remember when you started to work for me, right? So you need to say, I began to work for you in fall of 2018 and I've been working from with you since then, right? I mean, that part you're going to know, but still kind of giving an idea of when the relationship started and in what capacity you interacted with that person, right? Give them something to remember about you. Tell them how it is that you stood out. What did you do with them? What specifically were those interactions? What was your role, okay? And another thing that you wanna include in that request, in that email or handout or whatever it is that you provide to your letter writer, is some pointers that you would like their letter to touch on, right? So one thing that we've talked about repeatedly and we really want you to hang on to is that your letter is part of a puzzle, right? And so you have somebody else creating this piece of the puzzle, but if you can give some context, right? And so additionally, if you can give 
a draft personal statement or a finished personal statement or your resume and CV, we as letter writers then can take that information and the information that you supply us in those requests um, in the email itself and formulate a letter that complements how you're talking about yourself already, right? So we're going to take the time to take that information and say, okay, so they're saying these other things about themselves in their personal statement. What can I say about, you know, given the context that I person this, know this person in, what can I say about them that will add to that and kind of fill out the remaining picture, right, with whatever it is that I can say about this person. So make sure that you give some additional information that the person who's writing that letter can build off of. It may be that they decide to talk about something else anyway, but at least you've given them a direction to head in and a sense of what it is that you want to accomplish with your application and the picture that you want to paint. Okay, so now you're getting close to the end, right? You've identified what programs you're going to apply to, you've looked at the requirements, you've decided who you want to ask for letters, you've had a conversation with that letter writer about if they can write you a strong letter of recommendation, what they might need from you to be able to facilitate that process, when the letter will likely be submitted. Um, that all is, is conversations you're having on an individual basis. So you're very close to the end. Now it's just kind of making sure that that process um, completes itself. So if they've asked you for a finalized copy of your personal statement and your resume four to six weeks before your letter is to be written and submitted, it's now up to you to keep track of those dates and deadlines and ensure that you're following up with your letter writer with the information that that letter writer has requested of you. Now, that's stuff that you all have control over, so likely won't be causing you too much anxiety. What I hear from students quite often is a, is a large fear that their letter writer will agree to write them a letter, but then not follow up and actually submit the letter. So I have kind of two, two things to say to that is, if that does happen, you should definitely kind of keep contact and follow up with your letter writers. If, if there's been an agreement that in four to six weeks your letter has been submitted and you've provided all the information to the letter writer and the letter hasn't been submitted, then you should contact your letter writer, whether that be via phone or email, Obviously, as Susanna mentioned earlier, in this current climate, it would be difficult to stop by their office or see them in person. But normally, a student would have the option to say, do I want to contact this letter writer via email? Do I want to go to their lab? Do I want to go to their office hours? Do I want to show up to their, their research lab? It's really up to you to determine what type of contact, contact you feel most comfortable with. If you're an extroverted student who really feels more comfortable interacting with somebody in person, then you might want to go to their lab or I should say schedule a time to go to their lab. Make sure that the letter writer knows you're coming. Um, maybe contact the grad student or the TA for the class and find a good time to meet up with the faculty member or the letter writer. If you're a more introverted student, then email is fine. Um, email is a still a professional mode of communication, assuming that you approach your email in a professional manner. So it's, it's totally fine to communicate in that manner, whatever you feel most comfortable with. The other thing I'll say about this is, even though students have a lot of angst about letter writers not submitting letters and potentially student forums or forums in general on the internet indicate that this happens regularly, it's actually not something that I've seen happen very common in my professional experience. I really have one student every few years that genuinely authentically has had a letter writer agree to write a letter and the letter writer is not able to accommodate that for some reason. So it really doesn't happen as regularly as the fear is or the internet makes it seem. So, so hopefully that can reduce a little bit of anxiety.
but if you really are losing contact with your letter writer, um, it, it's just something that you can follow up with them via email or in person or some type of electronic communication. After your letter is submitted, you definitely don't need to send um, candies or gift cards or flowers. Um, it's no expectation that you send a gift of any nature to your letter writers. Your letter writers should be writing um, a strong letter of recommendation for your application because they believe in you as an applicant and they want to support your success as a student and as a human. It's not something that requires a gift, although a thank you email, um, certainly an update in the future of hopefully the success of your application would be extremely appreciated. One of the saddest things for me as a pre-health advisor is when I've been working with a student, regardless of whether I wrote them a letter, but I've been working with a student for years Helped them with their personal statement, did advising, maybe we did a mock interview, and the student never comes back to tell me that they were or were not accepted. Hopefully they were accepted, and maybe I see that on like some Excel database. And I went, oh man, I'm gonna pick on Verena who's in this call. And I've known Verena for three years and I didn't know that she got accepted to this great program. Um, that's, that's a really difficult moment I think for me as an advisor or for somebody who wrote you a letter. So just giving them an update on the outcome of your application, that's really the gift that we need as letter writers because we wouldn't be writing letters if we didn't support you as, as students and as humans. So your success is really the thank you and the gift that we need. Email, I, that's fine, but you don't need to, to purchase gifts for your letter writers. No. Can I add on to that? Yeah. Um, so um, when I got my PhD, I sent a little announcement with a little note to the professors who had written me a letter of rec from my bachelor's program. Right, so I got my bachelor's, I worked for two years, I got my master's, I got my PhD. So by the time I finished, it was 11 years since they had me in their class. And two of them wrote me back. And this one, look how excited she is, doctor. And my, I actually double majored in English and Spanish and my Spanish professor was so excited, he wrote me a two page letter back. Just because I updated them, I sent in my little note, I said I did it, I couldn't have even gotten started on this without your support, I really appreciate it. Here I am 11 years later, I have my PhD, and this is how much it meant. Even the guy, I didn't even go into his field, and he's still so excited he wrote me back. So it really does mean a lot to your letter writers to hear from you, to get these updates. Professor Felkel is like so excited <laughs> because I, I did it and he helped me on my way. Right. And just really quickly to, to, you know, agree with what Amber and Jennifer have said. We put a lot of effort into these letters, right? We spend a lot of time being as thoughtful and as thorough as we can be and saying the best that we know about you. And it means absolutely the world to get a thank you and then to find out how that worked out for you. And even if it's like, I mean, at this point, I've been on campus for four years and I still hear from some of the people that I wrote letters for in that first year and I maintain contact with them. And it means a great deal to know how things are going for them. So really, please do remember your recommenders. It will, it, and imagine if, you know, like Jennifer now has her letters that she can go back and look at, right? And her professors have their letters. Um, that she sent them, 10 years down the line, when we come across those letters somewhere, it's going to remind us of what this meant for us, right? So, so do remember your recommenders. So just a couple final thoughts here, then we'll open up to questions and we'll have you guys unmuted and be able to take Q&As. Not to end on, a, on a, a sour note, but the reality is, particularly in this current climate, not every recommender is going to be able to say yes. And that could be for a variety of different reasons. For a lot of my pre-health students who are getting ready to apply, this is 
kind of relevant to them because they may have been shadowing physicians or dentists or pharmacists or nurses or volunteering in hospitals with medical professionals that in any other given climate that professional would be happy to write a strong letter of recommendation for that student's application. However, due to the constraints of COVID-19, the workload of our medical professionals currently, um, the stress that they're under, potentially they may be quarantining away from their families. This is obviously a very kind of unique time. Some physicians who originally said yes, they could write a letter of recommendation might not be able to do so now. And that has absolutely nothing to do with you as the student or you as a human. It very well just may be the circumstances that we're currently living through. We're all living through history right now. And so this is pretty unprecedented territory and a lot of things are going to change. So having a backup plan is always a great idea. Not all medical schools require letters of recommendation from physicians. And so you may be able to supply an alternative letter of recommendation. Um, some faculty members on campus, particularly those that have extremely heavy teaching loads or may have primary teaching loads, might not be able to accommodate writing letters for every student that asks or every student that that person may want to write a letter for. So it might not have anything to do with you as a human or as an applicant. They may just have already overextended themselves in their ability to write letters, right? Some of our faculty are writing 30, 40, 50, 60 letters. And so adding to that just might not be realistic for their workload. So having a backup plan is great, knowing additional professionals and academics who can support your application, maybe adjusting your school list to accommodate schools in which you can supply letters of recommendation for, and even just thinking outside the box. Um, so for many of my students, um, they are highly involved in religious organizations on campus and off campus. And although you might not submit a letter of recommendation from a clergy member in a religious context, right, where the clergy member is discussing your relationship with your God, that, that probably wouldn't be appropriate outside of Loma Linda, but potentially a member of your religious organization can write a letter of recommendation about your service orientation, right, that you are at the location every week, assisting in, in whatever way, maybe you host a youth group or you mentor new members of the congregation, some members of your religious organization may be able to write a strong letter of recommendation about your soft skills outside of your nature of your relationship with your God. So again, in those backup plans, just be thinking about bosses. You know, did you work at McDonald's where your shift leader can write a letter? Did you work in housing or dining? Um, have you been a member of a community organization, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts? Um, so just be thinking of people who can speak to you and your qualifications both inside the classroom and outside the classroom. This is a, a new time for all of us, so we hope that this information is helpful in you thinking about how you might approach your upcoming application or your future application or maybe you're applying to an internship or a job. Remember that the letters that you submit are very dependent upon the program that you're applying to. We talked a lot about med schools, but maybe you're gonna be applying for a job and you're not really asking for a letter. Maybe you're just asking for a reference check, right? Somebody that can say, yes, this person worked in my office from this date to this date, and that's all the information that they need. So what you're applying to, when you're applying, who do you need to ask for, um, what's the timeline and what's the process? This is a very, all of those questions are very situational depending on what you're applying to and when.